Hey, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Ocal, every Tuesday and Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts, and also on the NHL on ESPN YouTube. Unfortunately, we begin the show uh, with the tragic news of Adam Johnson, former NHL player uh, who passed away uh, at the age of 29 after a freak accident during a game. Uh, he received a skate blade to the throat. Uh, it was a very, very tragic scene in the arena uh, in the EIHL, uh, fans were asked to leave the building, uh, the paramedics uh, and people surrounded him, uh, trying to revive him. Uh, and unfortunately he passed away at the age of 29, uh, a very tragic, uh, incident, uh, and the hockey world mourns wish for Adam Johnson today. Boy. Yeah. I mean, and all over the weekend too, it's, uh, you know, hockey's an inherently violent sport, and occasionally we get reminded of that inherent violence and and what can go wrong, very wrong in the sport. Um, and condolences to friends and family. It was it was a horrific scene. Um, you know, I think you and I have seen that scene before with the Clint Millar Chuck and, and, and incidences like this. Um, whenever something like this happens, uh, I'm always touched by the outpouring that we see from the hockey world. I mean, first of all, uh, shout out to the Elite Ice Hockey League in the UK uh, for having the good sense to postpone games on Sunday. Uh, Nottingham, his team, postponed uh, additional games on Tuesday. Uh, we saw tributes from all over the hockey world. Denmark, a league in Denmark, had his uniform number in the stands, obviously all over North America. Um, moment of silence held for Adam prior to the Heritage Classic between the Oilers and Flames on Sunday. Uh, really touching scene in uh, Scranton Wilkesbury, uh, where uh, Wilkesbury Scranton rather, where Adam played uh, as a minor leaguer for the Penguins. Uh, they had a game against Hershey, and both teams uh, formed a circle at center ice uh, to remember him. And then my, I think the most touching thing for me, got a little misty eyed watching it, was. Another team that Adam played for, the uh, Ontario Reign uh, of the American Hockey League, uh, put out a uh, stool in center ice after their game and uh, named him the first star. Um, and he uh, played there for two seasons. They draped a jersey over the stool and the players kind of went by and, and touched his number as uh, they skated off the ice. Really, really uh, stirring tributes. Arda, the... the the tragedy, of course, is going to do a lot of other things, too, besides solemn remembrances. It's going to start a bunch of people, unfortunately, speculating about the nature of the play. Um, you know, I did think that Dan Carcillo, if you wanted to look on his Twitter feed, had an interesting comment about um, the quality of play in different leagues. When a player who played in the NHL as long as he did uh, says that, I, I tend to pay attention. Um, so search that out if you're looking for kind of a different viewpoint. But the biggest thing that came out of this thing, Arda, obviously was reigniting the debate over neck guards. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, and and also uh, to everything that you just said, I think of uh, Teddy Balkand, the 16-year-old uh, that died under similar circumstances. Uh, I recall a petition being signed over 100,000 signatures. I think it got up to 140,000 signatures, actually, uh, to institute neck guards. And there was an NHL coach I apologize, the name escapes me right now, uh, that was asked about this. Uh, and his response was, "What? what is the cost? Like, essentially saying, what does it, like, we see this tragedy occurring at different levels of hockey, at, at many levels of hockey now in the last couple of years. And his point was, what is the cost? What does, like, for the possibility, however small it, smaller it might be in the NHL, due to the level of play, whatever you want to attribute it to. Just the idea of protecting that minute, possible minute percentage that something could occur. And remember last season we saw something, I believe it was Evander Kane and Pat Maroon, right? Mm -hmm. Skating over the the wrist, for example. So even wrist guards are into this conversation. So yeah. to me, it's... It, 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 I I believe it is something that should be considered. Obviously, I'm not one playing in the NHL, but in my head, logically, it seems like a no-brainer that further measures should be taken. Yeah, and it's going to take a mandate, right? And and part of the problem that we have right now with this is that um, 
you know, we haven't seen organizations like, for example, USA Hockey call for mandated neck guard protection. Uh, they recommend it, but it's not mandatory. Um, and until you have other leagues making it mandatory, uh, that's going to be the issue. Um, I really it, it was interested in in the take from Haley Wickenheiser, who's obviously a hockey yes. hall of famer, assistant GM for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, she said, I know it may not pass the quote unquote cool factor, but it's time for mandatory neck protection at every level in hockey. The risk is far too great not to. She wore one for 20 years playing for the national team. And uh, I don't think it necessarily impacted the play of Haley Wickenheiser. And and uh, by the way, so. she was not less cool wearing yeah. it. Like yeah. Haley Wickenheiser is one of the coolest hockey players ever. So right. uh, neck guard or not. So the problem is, is that it, it's it's twofold. One is, and, and other players, T.J. Oshie and others have pointed out that, that players don't like the look of it, don't want to wear it, what, whatever their personal reason is for not wanting to wear the equipment. That's the reason why they choose not to. Um, so, so that's one issue. The second issue is always, it always comes back to the NHLPA in situations like this. And, you know, the idea that if, let's say that the NHL decided we're going to mandate neck guards. Well, that needs to be signed off by the players union. They need to get the majority, the vast majority of their, of their players to sign off on it. And whenever you get to mandating certain pieces of equipment be used or altered or anything, it is an extraordinarily hard process on the league level to get that thing approved. Doesn't mean other leagues should be doing this, Arda, but I know on the league level when it comes to mandating a certain piece of equipment, I mean, think about the debates on visors back in the day and stuff like that. Um, it becomes very dicey as far as trying to get things passed. But hopefully... You know, looking at this tragedy and, and looking at the, the the words of people like Haley Wickenizer, for example, uh, they can come to consensus and, and and just have a common sense piece of equipment added to the kit to protect players better. And when when as as the team referred to it, a freak incident happens on the ice. Teddy Bluger is a forward for the Vancouver Canucks, played with Adam Johnson for three seasons in the Penguins organization. He joins us now on the drop to remember Adam. We're now joined here on ESPN's The Drop by Teddy Bluger. Of course, he plays for the Vancouver Canucks organization, but he spent several years in the Penguins organization with Pittsburgh and Wilkes-Barre Scranton playing with Adam Johnston. And Teddy, we really appreciate you joining us on the show today. I know it's not under the best of circumstances uh, as the hockey world mourns and remembers Adam Johnson and the unfortunate incident that occurred on the ice. Why don't we start with, your time with him as a teammate. What was he like as a hockey teammate? He was great. I think uh, like we just had such a great group of guys there and um, he was, he was funny. He's uh, kind of a dry sense of humor, very direct. And I think he just fit into, into the group of guys we had very, very well. Um, and I think like he never sugarcoated anything and, and, you know, that was kind of part of, part of, his humor, I guess. But at the same time, I think he wasn't worried about, you know, telling you something you didn't want to hear and um, things like that. So I think it made guys comfortable to go to him um, and, and talk about issues. I know we, we still have a group chat from, from those years in Wilkes-Barre with those guys. Um, so we were, obviously it was pretty active the last couple of days and guys were sharing some stories about him and stuff. And, um, one of the guys had mentioned when his dad passed away, Johnny was the first guys there for him and would just listen and not judge. And, um, you know, it was just very open as far as like talking things out. So he was very, uh, big heart, um, uh, great personality in the room. Um, just really, really awesome guy. Fun to be around. Teddy on that group chat, what was the prevailing sentiment? I mean, was it sorrow? Was it anger? Was it shock? Like what, what were you hearing from, uh his, his and yours friends from back of the day um yeah I mean I think I think a little bit of shock I mean I think for me for sure I think um that's how I heard something had happened one of the guys is message like hey you know Johnny got cut with a skate you know he's going into surgery and then you know obviously I looked it up right away online and saw saw a couple of quick articles about it and um I mean every once in a while kind of stuff like that happens but I think it's like not for a second that I think something, you know, he wasn't going to make it through. And then later on that night, you know, there's another message that someone had put in there like, Hey, like he didn't make it. So I think it was just like, even now it's just like hard to believe. It seems like at any minute he can chime in and group chat and, 
and uh, you know chirp someone or or say something. So I think I think it's honestly still kind of disbelief, like, and then probably more more sorrow and you know just just kind of extremely extremely sad because um you know he's still so young and it's just like it's crazy to think that you know one one freak incident like that and it's just you know something like that could happen and you know it could happen to anyone not just you know not just playing hockey but you know real you know crossing the street or driving in your car and it happens all the time so um obviously you don't go through your through life kind of thinking that way but um yeah so just kind of bit of kind of mixed emotions for sure what was your initial reaction teddy i mean you play at the highest level right and when you hear something like this happen what as as a player in the nhl how did you react i mean probably mostly just disbelief like you can't you know once in a while there's you know some bad injuries um you know, guys get cut, you know, rarely, but still can happen. But it, you know, seems like pretty much all the time guys make it through. And, um, you know, we got such great trainers and doctors around us taking care of us. So you say you always feel pretty safe and something like that. That's why, it, you know, when I first saw something like that happen, like it didn't cross my mind that there was really a possibility that he wouldn't make it. Like I was a hundred percent certain that he would end up being okay. Obviously it's a tough injury and, um, but yeah, it's just kind of like a very tragic outcome. So I think, um, yeah, just, just hard to believe that that's, that's how it, uh, kind of ended. Two, two part question for you. First of all, did, could you bring yourself to watch the highlight? Uh, no, not really. I, there's, uh, there's some people w watching in the training room today and, um, it was like very, very zoomed out. Like I took a quick glance, but no, not, not, not to watch the full thing. No. Yeah. I don't blame you, man. And then the second thing I was curious about, like, like Arda was talking about, I mean, you know, what the reaction is for somebody who's been in the NHL uh, for those of, who's of us that have never been in, in an NHL locker room game by game. Like, is this ever something that you guys talk about amongst yourselves, just how dangerous, potentially deadly, the game you play can be, or, or is it more something that's kind of left unsaid by you guys, maybe even superstitiously? I, I mean, I think as far as like, you know, that something like that could happen is more in my experience kind of left unsaid. I mean, I think, you know, there's been some discussion around the play and that it was just kind of um, like a weird, a weird angle that, that the guys, leg kind of got up in the air that it's it just seemed like like guys were saying they've never seen that kind of play happen before or for a guy to 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 kind of fall like that um but as far as like you know that could happen here i think i think not a lot of discussion surrounding that i think you don't want to you don't want to be thinking that you know going out there and you know, obviously a number of crazy things can happen, but yeah, I think you try to kind of avoid, avoid thinking about that. You know, I think like, you know, same as in football, you know, there's some terrible injuries that can happen, but I don't think you want to be like necessarily thinking about that when you're going out on the field. So Teddy, one of the things that has uh, spawned from this is the conversation about neck protection, right? Like just the idea of whether it's neck guards, whether it's turtlenecks, uh, some way to protect the neck at all levels of hockey, but also the NHL. How do you think this will forward the conversation? And do you see a world where this will become mandatory in the NHL, these kind of guards? Um, yeah, I mean, probably not, not right away, but I think eventually, you know, for sure, I think it wasn't that long ago that guys were playing without helmets, right? And now guys can't even go out for warmups without a helmet or, um, you know, everyone's wearing a visor. So I think in terms of like the safety and all that, I think, you know, it'll take some time and, you know, how many games have been played and, and, you know, there's probably only a handful of times where something like this has ever happened. So I, yeah, I'm sure, you know, I don't know whether it's the NHL or, or, you know, IHF or whoever it may be, you know, is going to look into it. Um, 
you know, have some research and, and assess kind of the risk and, and what can be done to, to prevent this kind of stuff from happening in the future. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't know as far as like, you know, whether they'll be mandatory or not, I probably can see a time where, you know, that could happen the way things have been trending with, you know, helmets and visors and different things like that. Last one for me, Teddy, and it's a follow up on that one. I mean, you know, I, I've heard from players over the years talking about neck guards saying they didn't like the look of them, saying that they didn't feel comfortable, saying, you know, we don't want someone to mandate that we wear something we don't necessarily need. Um, what was sort of your personal stance on neck protection and has this incident changed it at all? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Honestly, I didn't really have one. I wore one growing up because we, you know, we had to in, in youth hockey. And then um, since then, haven't really worn one, hasn't really crossed my mind to wear one. Um, I mean, I don't, like I said, I, I don't know if it, necessarily will i feel like i haven't gotten to that point yet of thinking that part through mm -hmm. um but i mean it's it's probably something worth considering or putting some thought into for sure i think you know you look at the other stuff um even just like shop blockers on skates i mean initially it's they can be uncomfortable and a little bit annoying at times but you know you get used to it and you know you get hit there with a puck and you're probably thankful you're wearing one so um, I mean, yeah, I think probably everyone has to make up their own mind, but it's definitely something that's, you know, worth considering. And I'm sure, you know, now it'll be a hot topic conversation and maybe you'll see guys like I remember Thomas Placanitz was wearing that, the uh, turtleneck he had, he was known for. So, um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me to see more guys wearing, wearing that stuff. Teddy, last question for you. Uh, you were talking about, you know, stories that people are saying about Adam, uh, as we remember him in his life uh, on the ice, a lot of Penguins fans will remember uh, an, uh, a moment that you two will be linked with forever is um, he gets hit in the boards and you come in uh, not liking what you saw there. Can you just reflect on that? It was in 2019 against the Ducks. What do you remember from that? Yeah, I, I, I actually do remember that play. Um, I think we talked about it after and he kind of said he lost his edge a little bit. So the hit wasn't, wasn't as bad as, as maybe it looked from my angle, but um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it looked bad and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of what you do for your teammates a lot. And obviously um, with him, you know, he, he hadn't played too many games at that point and um, you want him to do well because you know, you know what it's like grinding together in the minors and everyone's just dreaming to get called up. And I remember when he scored his first goal in Minnesota and you know how awesome that was for him playing at home and um having a great game there. And um yeah, I think like with Johnny, it's like one of those guys, it's kind of like um like I think that's why we have that close group kind of from Wilkesbury because we were all there together. We're all similar age. Everyone's just trying to get to the same goal. We're all going through the same stuff. Um, so I think you kind of bond with those guys naturally. It's kind of like maybe guys that you go to college with that are in your class or in your dorm, you know, you're like your roommates because you spend so much time together. And um, so similar thing with him. So, he, yeah, I mean, I remember that play well. And um, he was a great player. I spent some time obviously playing with him on a line in Wilkesbury too. And, um, you know, he was smart. He had great speed. So he was awesome to play with. And, um, great to be around in the room, obviously, as well. Yeah. Teddy, I know it wasn't the best of circumstances to join us here, but we appreciate you reflecting uh, and giving us your thoughts here. Uh, thanks for joining us. For sure. Thank you. Our thanks to Teddy Bluger and our condolences to him and to Adam's teammates, everyone, everyone that cared about him. A couple things to add. First of all, the South Yorkshire police have announced that they have opened an investigation into the death of adam johnson um as they do for many unnatural deaths uh they said quote on, mo on monday that officers remain at the scene carrying out inquiries and our investigation into the circumstances surrounding the incident remain ongoing also uh the english ice hockey association has resolved to make neck guards mandatory uh starting on uh, in january 2024 
aligning with the Ice Hockey UK and Scottish Ice Hockey Association. So I thought this was an interesting line in their announcement, Arda. They said, quote, it is unacceptable for any player to lose their life while playing sport. Our responsibility is not only to avert the reoccurrence of such a heartbreaking accident, but also to preemptively address other foreseeable incidents in the future. I do wonder if we will hear something along those lines from places like USA Hockey or the NHLPA at some point. Absolutely. That is ongoing. The Daily Mail uh, wrote an article. Uh, about Matt Petgrave, who was the player whose skate hit Adam Johnson. Uh, he was reported to be absolutely distraught. Um, and he's been receiving vile messages online from heartless trolls. This is all from the article following the shocking incident. Uh, the Panthers fans, the team that Adam played for, said no one was to blame for the horrific accident described watching Petgrave break with shock and trauma after seeing what had happened. That is from the Daily Mail article. This is a statement from the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins uh, Senior Vice President of Operations, Brian Coe, who worked extensively with Adam Johnson during his time in the Penguins organization. Quote, Adam spent three years playing here in Northeast Pennsylvania, made a positive impact on and off the ice. An incredibly dedicated, hardworking player. He went from being undrafted out of college to making it all the way to the NHL. Reserved, but friendly. He was always happy to talk to fans, sign an autograph, snap a selfie, or help out at a school appearance. Our thoughts are with his friends, family, and teammates. We shift our focus now to Shane Pinto, suspended 41 games by the NHL for activities related to sports wagering. I uh, wish the exact information on the circumstances revolving this is still scarce. Certainly there are theories out there. All we know is that the NHL has come out and said, Shane Pinto did not bet on NHL games, and we know the severity of the suspension, 41 games. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've heard a few versions of of what went down, and uh, I think it's clear he didn't bet on NHL games, but I think the conversations that we're having about proxy betting and people using accounts that uh, might be open in your name and things of that nature are are pretty salient ones. And, and I think that you can kind of connect the dots to understand why the NHL felt a, a suspension was warranted here. Uh, I do think this is a harsh education for NHL players in the last week, Arda. I was speaking to a few of them and, uh, and they've discovered some things about sports wagering in the NHL today uh, in this landscape where obviously millions of dollars are coming into the league from uh, sports betting partners and sponsorships. One, a lot of them were unaware that when you open an account with one of these sports betting sites or apps or what have you, uh, your account is flagged. And uh, on a monthly basis, there's a report that gets sent to all these leagues about your betting activity on that account. Uh, a lot of the players I spoke to were very unaware of this, uh, and it is a bit of an education to know that when you put in that 10-team NFL parlay on a Sunday, uh, Gary Bettman gets a copy of it at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the players were unaware that proxy betting was, one, a violation of the terms of service in a lot of these apps, um, which is uh, definitely the case, and two, that the NHL would drop the hammer on you if, in fact, there was somebody betting on an account that was open in your name, even if it's not you. Uh, that's because the players I've spoken to, Arda, told me that the NHL doesn't exactly spell out everything that's allowed or not allowed in, in sports wagering under their current rules. Now, don't bet on hockey. They know that. That's posted in the locker room. They know it's basically the end of your career if you get caught betting on hockey. Uh, the NHL has been pretty adamant about, uh, you know, maintaining the integrity of of the game and everything else. Uh, I think the proxy betting thing is something that they weren't aware of. Um, and the feedback I've gotten from players I've spoken to is that they would like to have more direct and specific feedback from the league um, at the beginning of each season when they're going over all of the rules for what not to do as a player off the ice to kind of set the ground rules a little bit more starkly for things like proxy betting. And, and just to add on proxy betting, and, and again, I'm not speculating that this happened with the Shane Pinto situation. Mm -hmm. This is a general observation. Um, a lot of people might not know that if you, let's say, let's say I have an account, okay, mm -hmm. hypothetical situation. When I log into my account, 
there's an internet address, an IP address that is associated with my login, right? Mm -hmm. So the website, the uh, gambling site knows exactly where I'm logging in from. Now, if I ask Greg Wyshynski to make a bet on my behalf in my account, again, hypothetical situation, you will be from a different location. So it will be tracked. It will be known that you are logging into my account from a different location. And that might flag uh, and whatever, a, 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 a further look into the activity, et cetera. So that could be one of the red flags that was waived. Just simple, a location yeah. was different. Let's say hypothetically you were playing a game of hockey in Canada and someone in, was using an account in your name in the United States. Let's just say hypothetically that was the case. That would be something that gets flagged. Um, sure. Also, let's let's also just park it on proxy betting for a second. I mean, just so so people kind of understand the dynamics here. Like it is very, very much on the table. And this is not what happened with Pinto necessarily, but very much on the table that you are giving someone information uh, about your team or other teams that can then be used to bet on hockey. And it may not be you placing the bet, but it could be somebody placing the bet on your behalf. You know, that's the kind of thing that could happen. And, and I think the NHL wanted to make it very emphatic and clear that that can't happen. Now, how emphatic was it? It was half a season emphatic. And that brings me to my third point about the education for players on the Shane Pinto suspension, which is that they learned the NHLPA is not going to fight the NHL when it comes to gambling suspensions. Um, I heard that there was a lot of negotiation behind the scenes between the NHL and the PA over the course of weeks regarding what would happen with Shane Pinto. Uh, I heard that it got down to 41 games through negotiation. Um, and I heard that perhaps the reason why there isn't an appeal is that that was also part of the uh, discussion behind the scenes is we'll bring it down here. You guys don't appeal. We all move on with our lives. Um, but I had one agent tell, tell, tell me that you know, this isn't going to be the last gambling suspension in the NHL. Um, it's a brave new world. Uh, the details of this, from what we understand, make you believe that it was kind of a mistake on Pinto's part. It wasn't something nefarious. He obviously didn't bet on hockey himself. And so there's a thought out there that maybe the PA should have fought a little bit harder on this. Um, this is the first big suspension of the legalized sports wagering era in the NHL for lack of a better label. And so now it's 41 games. That's the benchmark. That's the benchmark for whatever Pinto did. And there was a little bit of surprise from, from at least one agent I spoke to that the PA didn't fight a little bit more adamantly to, you know, set the bar at a certain spot uh, for players when it comes to infractions like this, because again, Arda, it's not going to be the last time that we see it. And and now the, the bar is set at 41 games and good for the NHL for putting the fear of God in these guys as far as like losing half a season. But uh, it is curious that there wasn't more of a fight, um, maybe even in an arbitration way to try to figure out where the suspension should land. I also saw a lot of discourse online about comparing this suspension to other like on ice infraction suspensions and and other things saying you know look at the severity of this versus other things mm -hmm. to me i read it as this is very important this sends a message like you said and this will dissuade players or at least make them aware and the paradigm will be i have to be very careful and not do this right just just make sure that i'm in the right doing um, things properly yep Exactly. All right. Uh, Pinto thing is uh, is what it is. A couple things before we get to power rankings. Want to give a shout out to the NHL for putting on another great outdoor game. The Heritage Classic on Sunday between the Oilers and Flames was really dope, ex despite the presence of Nickelback. The Oilers uniform. Oh, don't sell that to Connor McDavid. <laughs> I know. I mean that 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 man is a is a flawless player, but a flawed uh, music fan. Um, the Oilers jerseys <laughs> that we maligned on the previous episode of the drop. I got to tell you, man, again, they look pretty good on the ice. I, 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 I will, I will may a culpa with the fact that the Brown gloves, Brown pants, uh, the jerseys, the, the kit looked pretty good. Um, and it was obviously just a, a really cool uh, event pulled off. Well, and uh, and a big win for the Oilers, too, to get back on track. Uh, also, to keep uh, with the uh, maudlin tone of this uh, episode of The Drop, R.I.P. Matthew Perry, um, a TV comedy legend who was a big celebrity puckhead, big L.A. Kings fan, 
uh, always kind of was hockey adjacent and uh, sorry to, to, to see him go so young. Um, but, uh, but certainly had a NHL connection during his life uh, as a, as a pretty big hockey fan. Yeah. And he uh, also had ties to Ottawa and was a big senators guy as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move on to power rankings. Uh, we do this every week on the drop and I will be honest, Wish, uh, some of these teams that we have in our top 10, I would have expected to see here at the start of the season. Maybe not necessarily in this order and definitely not one that falls in the top three. Uh, why don't you take us through our top 10 in the power rankings? All right. As of Sunday, so this is a fresh week, top 10 power rankings. 10 is the Detroit Red Wings. Then we've got the Los Angeles Kings. The Toronto Maple Leafs at eight. The New Jersey Devils at seven, kind of finding their form a little bit, but maybe not defensively. Uh, the New York Rangers at six. The Dallas Stars at five, a team that has not played as many games as others, but is still playing extraordinarily well. The Colorado Avalanche at four. The juggernaut that are the Vancouver Canucks are to, at three. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then the Boston Bruins at two and the Vegas Golden Knights, who look like they have not missed the beat. They look like they, outside of that one hiccup against Chicago, uh, they look like they've been playing game six of the final for the last month uh, at number one. Any, any, anyone in this top 10 that you dispute? I can't believe, I mean, I can't believe the Vancouver Canucks are at three. They're five, two and one. They deserve it. They're second in the Pacific. It's not like I'm disputing their start in any way. I'm just like, okay, we had high hopes for Elias Pettersson, like, you know, taking that step to elite greatness, et cetera. But to be third in the power rankings after 10 or so games uh, or eight or so games is, is very impressive. And also the Boston Bruins. How much time did we spend before the season talking about their demise and their regression as a wild card team? And they're like, nah, we got another one left in us. You know, I told you, I, I, Jimmy Montgomery coaching, the goaltending being what it is, McAvoy, Lindholm, they were going to be fine. I didn't think they'd be this good, but they were going to be fine. Um, the, the, the Vancouver thing, listen, I, I, we talked about this earlier, man. It was a consortium of people doing the NHL rank. It wasn't me saying Seth Jones was better than Quinn Hughes. I was on this podcast and that dumb list published to tell you I didn't think that Quinn Hughes was worse than Seth Jones. Okay, so please, I beg of you, Vancouver fans, stop tweeting at me about it. I had nothing to do with it. It's not my fault. I'm a huge. You think you think me? You think I'm going to bemoan anybody named Hughes in this league? Of course I'm not. <laughs> So I understand the flaw in the process. Let it be known. I am overjoyed to see Quinn Hughes getting his flowers early in this season. I think he has an, a shot at being a Norris finalist, maybe even winning the thing based on how well he's played. But my God, I do not think Seth Jones is better than Quinn Hughes. Uh, actually, Greg Wyshynski put the entire list together by himself. There was no <laughs> extra help. There was no voting process. You're not helping. You're not Please. helping. On social media, tag him on all of your vitriol. All right. uh, the only two teams, by the yeah. way, who have yet to suffer a regulation loss in the NHL are our top two in the power rankings, the Golden Knights and the Bruins. Yeah, exactly. Uh, speaking of Seth Jones, let's get to the bottom five. We do this every time we do power rankings on the show. The bottom five in the NHL right now at 28, the Edmonton Oilers. They're still climbing out of the hole. They're still climbing out of the hole. One one good outdoor game does not a season make. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks at 29, higher than I expected. I mean, they've been pretty impressive in some of these games, Art. I got to admit, like that that win on the road in Vegas was, was pretty good. Uh, Seattle Kraken at 30, a, a team that uh, needs to get back on track, find their identity, and, and also uh, hope for better goaltending. Uh, the Calgary Flames... Listen, I, I have come to this point with the Flames, Arda, where I believe that they have made a tactical error within their organization to not have tanked. Now, maybe they're going to tank by 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 virtue of not being any good. But, um, you know, I've been saying for a couple of years now that they're a supporting cast in search of a star after Goudreau and Kachuk left, after they traded to Foley to the Devils. He's been awesome. Um, and this this that 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 should have led to them tanking this year. And, and trying to find that star that they can then put in the middle of that supporting cast. Maybe it happens anyway. They're not playing good hockey. And then finally, the San Jose Sharks are a special kind of terrible. Oh my God. They're so bad. I had a play, I had a player when I was when I was asking around about the gambling stuff, I had a player tell me, 
they might not win a game this year, <laughs> which is just like yeah. not a thing you want to hear about an NHL team, unless you're an NHL team that is desperate for something to grab onto, some sort of direction, some sort of North Star that they can follow through the desert. Uh, the Sharks are terrible, but a, but an impressively kind of terrible. Or yeah. through Silicon Valley. Uh, they are the only team in the NHL right now without a win. Uh, and as you said, they could go the whole season without a win. I guess we will celebrate their first win if and when it does come. Uh, that does it for us here on The Drop. Remember, at Wyshynski for all of your uh, hate tweets, uh, particularly about our top 100, which Greg had everything to do with, obviously. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday with a very special interview. The Rated R superstar, Adam Copeland, will be joining us. Uh, and he's got some really cool hockey stories, including something to do with the Toronto Maple Leafs that you definitely want to tune in for. Uh, he's got a cool uh, behind-the-scenes story uh, about the Leafs and a couple of players that he shares on the podcast. So look forward to that. Thank you very much for listening. We'll catch you on Thursday. Thanks, folks.